Welcome instructors and students to the Tomorrow's Technician livecast sponsored by Summit Racing. And today I'm with Mark Lake from Summit Racing. He is uh, director of training or? Yeah, part, main part of it, I guess you could say. <laughs> so, and today we're talking about big brake kits. What do they do? What's the advantages of them? Um, and what can, you know, this do for uh, a vehicle? We're also kind of discuss some of the physics behind um, braking. Sorry about that. Um, we might need the volume turned off on the, the TV in the studio. It's creating a little bit of a, a, a back feed. Uh, just a second on that, but. <clears throat> Um, I think I can talk over it somewhat, um, but with these brake upgrades, they're safety upgrades for the most part. Yeah, definitely. I, you know, when we, we talk about this, you know, the biggest thing that we want to talk about is um, the application. You know what I mean? You know, I, I don't know if on a stock application we would see the, the most, um, you know, safety upgrade. You know, but definitely on these on these race cars that we see day in and day out, um, it, it is a huge safety upgrade. So let's talk about the physics of braking. This is a stock brake system off of one of my vehicles, and over here is the Willwood um, big brake conversion kit that we have that I installed on the vehicle probably about two years. I think it stood up pretty well. Yeah. Um, and just the different advantages of what you're replacing with a big brake kit. When I replaced this, it was the caliper. Um, it was a two-piece rotor. And if you look down here, you'll also see the adapter plate that holds it to the knuckle. And the most important piece with engineering some of these kits is a ring to make sure that the rotor is centered on the vehicle and this supports it on the stock wheel flange or hub and it's a it's a nice kit it's all bolt-on no fabrication but the comparison to the stock brake it's a little bit day and night I mean I'm not getting that much of a stopping distance increase sure. decrease but just the overall robustness or the longevity of the brakes going around a track a couple times, it's, it's pretty remarkable. Oh yeah, without a doubt. You know, you, you talk about um, the biggest thing, especially in, in road race, autocross, whatever, you talk a lot about uh, brake fade. You know, when you go to these, these factory, you know, uh, rotors and pads and caliper, you know, the first five, six times, not really gonna notice too much of a difference. You, you might feel a little bit stiffer pedal, uh, a little bit less flex, um, but it's it's when you start taking those multiple, multiple, multiple uh, corners. That's when you don't notice that brake pedal when you have to jam on it as hard as you can. It's not going to fade or give away. Um, that that that's that's the main thing. So you know, again, you just you just got to kind of qualify what are you doing. And also with this kit, it was kind of amazing just the number of different friction options that I had. So I was able to change out the brake pad um, for a track day that I had to a more aggressive compound. And trust me, I wouldn't want to use that on the roads because it's really easy to uh, lock up or they also require a little bit more heat in them to work properly. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it's almost funny to say, but who would ever think that you'd have to heat up your brakes to make them work? I mean, it's kind of backwards thinking, you know, you, you don't want to jump in this, 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 you know, this application and say, gosh, I got to start my car up and stop it 10, 15 times to, to get the brake pads heated up. So, you know, like you were saying, they offer all these different uh, brake pad options. And, you know, again, you have to qualify what are you doing? You know, what type of stopping are you doing? You know, you don't want to jump in the car jump on the track real quick and start racing and your brake pads not, you know, be warmed up. You know, they, ha they operate at different temperatures. So, you know, it, it also makes it nice, you know, with some of these Willwood ones, some of these other manufacturers, that it makes it so simple to swap out the pads. That's the other kicker. You know, I mean, you start doing multiple brake jobs, 
you're, you're, you know, that's, that's time. So let's say you do, it ha you do have it on your daily driver, but then on the weekends you like to really go hard at the track. Well, now you can swap up those pads pretty quickly. And just the options, I think that's a BP-10 compound from Will Wood. I, the other pad, I think it was a BP-30 compound. And I also have the Polymatrix um, mm -hmm. friction materials. And it's definitely um, a change. And more than anything, it helps in the modulation of the brake pedal. Sure. That's the one thing I can get close to lockup and close to maximum braking potential for the vehicle. But, you know, that's just one of those things that you never thought that, you know, would be possible with that. Um, you just think shorter stopping distances, but it's actually better breaking into a corner, yeah. trail breaking into the corner. I mean, there's the options are just endless. In, 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 in itself, it almost makes it like the car handles better too. You know, and who would ever think that, you know, I'm going to change my brakes, I'm going to get better handling. You, you know what I'm saying? Like, you're thinking, when you think handling, you're thinking, you know, something suspension-wise. You're thinking, oh man, if I do this coil over, if I do this control arm, I do this whatever, I'm going to get better handling. Well, now it, when you do these brakes, you're getting better handling as well. Uh, just a reminder, please uh, post your questions on YouTube or Facebook, um, and we'll get to those questions. Um, I'll be watching him right here on my phone. But you brought up the handling aspect of it, and it's also acceleration. I think the, the greatest comparison you could probably do, if we compared the weight of the components from the Willwood kit versus the stock brakes, so we've got our scale here. It's actually a postal scale. Mm -hmm. So we'll be able to, this is from my eBay business. Um, let's weigh these and, and, and see the difference between the two uh, systems. So with this, let's see if you can see that on screen, 26 pounds and 7 ounces. And that's the full caliper and also the, uh, the uh, cast rotor itself. Um, this one I actually think it's from StopTech, same with the pads. But let's measure the big brake kit and see what we got. Sixteen pounds. How many ounces is that? Nine. <laughs> it's almost seven. Nine point three. Yeah, that's almost seven. Yeah, seventeen pounds um, for this set. So that's almost a ten-pound difference. Yeah, almost. Yeah, absolutely. So just think about that. And I mean, it's better. Oh, it's it's a lot better. <laughs> um, so with this, you know, better braking, better acceleration. Um, you're also going to improve handling, and you yeah. know, you brought the handling point. Um, Physics-wise, I mean, it's like putting a stiffer set of springs on the car because yeah. that's unsprung weight. Right. And, uh, you know, you're also allowing the shocks and struts to work a little bit better because they're, they're 10 pounds lighter. Right. And it's crazy. It's bigger. You know, you, you start to think, okay, now I have, I'm putting bigger parts for stopping. And it's got better handling, and, it, and it's going to weigh less. You know, you start, it, it, you know, it's almost like it's an infomercial, and it's too good to be true. Yeah, especially, you know, think about it. If I'm, on my car where I have these on there, I've got them also in the rear. I mean, 40 pounds off of a vehicle? I mean, yeah. that's at least a tenth of a second of better acceleration and also handling, too. Yeah. And, and, and you know, usually you're paying buku money to get that little bit, and you're putting a lot more work in, and you're not going to get that full circle of it's going to be faster, it's going to handle and it's going to stop better. A lot of times when you improve to, to go faster, um, to get quicker down the track, whatever, you know, you're just improving one thing, be, you know, via engine. You know, you're not, you know, but then when you improve the engine, you know, it's kind of like a teeter-totter effect where you're saying, okay, I'm improving my engine, but now because I've improved my engine, now I'm talking about, okay, my car might not handle as well my car might not stop as well. You know, you put that, you know, you talk about big camshafts. Big camshafts can affect braking. Yep. And, you know, so it's, it's like, you know, oh, great, I got this fantastic engine. You know, it's putting out more horsepower, but I'm not getting the same thing 
with brakes. So it, it's kind of a neat combo, and it's it's a different way of thinking, that's for sure. I mean, you look at some of the top fuel dragsters out there. Um, those rear brakes, what is it, titanium rotor, yeah. uh, four six-piston caliper on the back, and they're still using a parachute. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's, it's almost something that you would see off the movies. Um. But, you know, even if you think about this caliper, this caliper is an aluminum body on here. And the OEs are looking at lightness, too. I mean, back in the day, a lot of these calipers, they weighed quite a bit. Um, Cast iron. Oh, gosh, you look at some of the old GM uh, Delco Moraine stuff, you know, those four-piston calipers that they had on the old muscle cars <laughs> as an option. Those things were a boat anchor. Oh, yeah, you'd almost throw out your back picking them up. Uh, I mean, it was, in, it was ridiculous. And then, you know, if, you know, then you have to ship them back. Yep. You know, because there's a core charge on them or something. And, it, you know, it practically has to go truck freight. And with this system, you know, they put aluminum, but for serviceability out there, if you're a technician in the field, aluminum is a different material than cast iron. And there's always that propensity, you know, if you're dealing with a banjo bolt or one of the lines coming in, to uh, cross thread that. And, and, and then, you know, then you start talking about some of these, these upgrades with the, um, you know, the calipers. Then you start talking about how, when you go to a disc brake conversion, um, or you're upgrading to a bigger brake, how they mount. Oh, okay. You know, you, you talk about how they mount, uh, whether it's a, you know, what, like a radial style, a lug style. It, it really depends on how, how, how are they mounting. Yeah, this is a lug style type kit and adapter on there. Yeah. Uh, Eric Anderson, thank you for uh, bringing your class here. Um, yeah, any questions you got, please type them in, we'll answer them. Um, but it's definitely a big upgrade. Plus, with this, it's a stiffer caliper. Yeah. If you look at the bridge on here compared to the bridge on the other one, it's much, much stiffer on the Willwood caliper. Um, because you have the piston over here, and it's pushing on this part right here, even though it does glide, um, there's always that propensity for flex that changes the brake pedal. And, and that's the last thing that you want to be saying with, with <laughs> brakes is flex. You know, you go to stop on that corner where you really got to bring it from 100 down to 40 real quick. Yeah. The last thing you want to be using the word is flex, because then when you start using the word flex, you're going to start using the other word, and that is broke. Yep. <laughs> you know, and, 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 you know, when you get these, these upgrades with these calipers, um, you know, they're less likely to flex. So when you do stop on that, not only is it not going to fade, but it's going to be stiffer. It's going to be more rigid. You know, it's going to apply that brake pad to that rotor evenly instead of, you know, maybe the first couple times with this OEM caliper, you're not going to notice that, honestly. But the more you do it, as in road racing, as in track racing, drag racing, the, the more that you have to step on that and hold that, the quicker that flex or that other word break <laughs> is going gonna, gonna to happen a lot quicker. Quick question came in, more of a comment here. Um, <clears throat> are drum brakes better than disc brakes in terms of stopping power? You want to tackle that? I'll tackle that one. Okay. Um, in all honesty, y yes. It's the question of the surface area between the drum and the shoes themselves and how the shoes self-energize. Yes, they can produce more braking force depending on the friction material. But the big limiting thing with drums is their ability to dissipate heat. And it was always a question for the OEs. If you go back in time, you start looking at Pontiac, um, even Chrysler did this. They had a, a cast aluminum drum, and then they poured in a liner of cast iron for the braking surface, just to reduce that mass. And you know, aluminum is better at rejecting heat than cast iron. So in some ways, yes. Some ways, no. Um, disc brakes are better at modulating the force and controlling it. This is why just about every single ABS vehicle has disc brakes. Yeah, let me add to that. Um, so the, the, the way that I look at it might be different than a, a factory option. You know, we run into people, um, let's say they have drum brakes, and they go off-roading. 
okay? Uh, as in, uh, they take it and they uh, go four by four and maybe in a Jeep, maybe some off-road rig, and it has factory axles on it, and they haven't done a disc brake conversion, okay? So now, uh, one of the, uh, I guess, weaknesses you could say to a drum brake is, is water and mud, <laughs> you know? You, you get water and mud into a drum brake application, you've pretty much no longer going to stop as well, even remotely. You know, I've, I've, I've had a couple off-road uh, vehicles myself um, where, you know, you, you, you take it off-road and it, 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 once you, let's say it's rained the day before, whatever, it's horrible. And that was even the case, you know, back in the, the 50s and 60s, you know, and even before that, where vehicles had drum brakes all the way around, where today, you know, you're lucky to even see it on the rear, you know. Um, where, you know, people would get stuck in the rain and that water would get trapped inside that drum and you'd push it to the floor thinking you were going to stop and you're not stopping anymore. <laughs> uh, so there's, there's ways to look at it. Um, so again, it, it's the qualification of what are you using this for? And like I said, you know, stock applications, yeah, you, I mean, you know, on the rear, you, you probably aren't going to go, oh my gosh, oh, what a... What a huge upgrade, you know, but when you're using it for off-roading, you're using it for racing, any form of racing, yeah, it's a, it's a huge upgrade. Got another comment back here from the audience. Uh, thank you, Jeff, for putting this question. Well, what about water and disc brakes? Yeah, uh, I mean, it's, it's still a, it's still a, a you know, huge no-no, right? But it's not as bad in, in a drum. You know, with, a, with an actual rotor, a, a lot of rotors are, are two-piece. You know, they're a two-piece design, and they're able to fling that water as it's rotating off. Um, you know, so the water isn't getting trapped inside that drum. You know, when you, you guys obviously know the difference between disc and, and drum, well, as soon as you put that drum on, it's like putting a cap on it. And yes, water could leak out of it, and, and yes, it's not a sealed unit, but it's a heck of a lot more sealed unit than a, than a disc brake. So, you know, water and braking never, will never be a perfect mixture, um, but it's a lot better with a, with a rotor. It's funny, uh, looking at um, Dodge, they're kind of concerned with it, because that's a pretty good sized rotor on, on the Charger and also the Challenger, that what they're doing now is they're concerned about water on, mm -hmm. the, on the rotor. And also, but it's a lot of the absorption of the pad getting wet. So sure. you have two wet surfaces. What they're doing is, is it detects if the wipers are on, and then it may do this little routine to bring the pads in contact with the rotor just to get rid of some of the water on the, the, the rotor itself. Kind of a, a neat system that you've you know, you got to be aware of. But this is even from um, Dodge, where actually post-corner, mm -hmm. if you get like the fancy uh, Brembo brake kit on that, it does this little routine after a corner. It actually pulses the brakes to get the pistons in proper alignment with the, uh, the rotor itself because they figured out that, okay, there's flex in the flange, and if you go around a corner, it could pop back the pad, so the next stop, you're like, a few extra stops. So that's actually... That's it, impressive. It, it, it's, it's amazing what, how far technology has gone, and you know, as a student, you're going to see a lot more of this really interesting stuff especially with even hybrid vehicles, um, pedal simulators and everything else. And, you know, a lot of the physics that you learn about brakes will apply to EVs even. I mean, let's talk about EVs. I mean, that's, oh boy. We'll, 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 we'll limit it to this thing. Um, there is actually a kit out there, a big brake kit for Tesla with carbon ceramic rotors. <laughs> And it's not about, it's a little bit about performance, but it's more about the range of the vehicle. Yeah. So, let's go back in time here a little bit. Okay. You've got, you're, you're at Summit, and you probably get tons of calls mm -hmm. from customers with their project vehicles, and they're looking to upgrade their brakes. You know, they upgraded the engine, as you said before, with an LS or something. What are some of the roadblocks dealing with some of these oddball applications and uh, putting bigger brakes on them? Uh, 
you know, uh, knowing what you have is, is the, and it, you wouldn't think that would be such an issue. Um, but there's so many times people get this project car that has, that has been modified, you know, and, and the guy ran out of money or, you know, the age old saying, yeah, he's having a baby, buying a house or whatever. And, uh, he's, he's, he's run out of money. So now he sells it to this guy and this guy, you know, wow, well, I know it's a 69 Chevelle. I, I know it has an LS in it. And, uh, he told me it was factory brakes. Then we send them a disc brake conversion and nothing's working. <laughs> you, you know, and it, it's, uh, it's one of these issues where, you know, there, there's so many if and if this, then that, if not, then this. And so now we have to, we kind of have to say, okay, you have to be so intimate with that, that vehicle. You got to know, you know, anything from staggered shocks. Why would I need to know if I have staggered shocks? Well, that depends on where they mount the actual caliper. Okay. Well, was it a factory disc brake car or was it a full all-wheel drum? I don't know. I bought it and it had disc brakes on it. Well, the, the only reason we ask that is, is it, it, you know, if it had drums, it probably had a different uh, spindle on it. Okay. Well, how am I supposed to know that? You know, so we, we run into these issues where it's like, okay, there's that, and then, then you talk about master cylinder, you know, where it's a single bowl master cylinder, and now it's not going to put out enough pressure or volume for the actual vehicle to stop if they go to a disc brake conversion or the proportioning valve is wrong. So there's, it's like, man, you really got to know what you have, or, you know, you get that kit that changes everything, where, you know, but you are going to pay Buku money to do this. But if this is your, you know, hey, this is my love, this is my favorite car, it's really, at the end of the day, it's not, not as bad. But it, it, those are some of, those are just some of the roadblocks. You know, I used, I used this example the other day where guys like, hey, I bought this, uh, I bought this 67 Chevelle, I want this, this brake conversion. We send it to them. You know, a typical 67 Chevelle had a 10 bolt rear end in it, okay? So we sent it to him front and rear. He got the master cylinder, the brake booster, proportioning valve. He even got new spindles. Hmm. You can get it with drop spindles so it can lower the car as well. Now, he calls up and says, hey, everything on the front bolt, great. The rear, not even close. <laughs> We're like, yeah. What, what type of rear end do you have in that vehicle? Oh, well, the guy bought a Curry Ford 9-inch. And you're like, oh, well, that would have been nice to know. <laughs> but then let's add a little bit more to that. Uh, a Ford 9-inch, they have different housing ends on the axle housing. So not only did we need to know, oh, yeah, it's a Ford 9-inch, but oh, yeah, it also has one of these three housing ends on that Ford 9-inch. And oh, yeah, on top of those three flanges, there's different offsets to it as well. So, you know, when you get this, it's like opening Pandora's box. It's not, it's not impossible, and I don't want to make it sound like that, but sometimes you've got to get a little bit more familiar with that application. We just had a comment here. Um, what about changing the pivot point of the brake pedal depending on the brake kit? That's smart. Yeah. That's real smart. Um, yeah, pedal ratio is, 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 is such an important thing because let me just keep using this example, okay? Got the 69 Chevelle. You got everything that bolts up. Now you're like, man, I just spent $3,000, $4,000. I should stop on a dime. You know, I mean, I, I, I would. If I spent that much money, I'd want to stop, and I'd want to stop now. Now you stop, and the, it doesn't, doesn't have the right pedal, you know, and you're like, Oh, is something wrong here? Do, do I have air in the line? Is there, well, pedal ratio is, it comes big into play and it also comes into play whether you have manual brakes or power brakes. You know, the, the, the power brakes, you don't, you don't need as high of a, of a pedal ratio. Uh, but in a manual brakes, you know, you typically want the, the five to seven to one ratio where your power brakes, you want like a four to five. 
So why I say that's so smart is, is because you have to measure it in, in two different spots. Yep. Um, you have to measure where the, the pivot point to the, the center of the actual uh, uh, brake pedal, that's one measurement, and then from where it hits in the center of the master cylinder to that pivot point. You take those two measurements, and, and, and by no means, I, I know we get in the, in the habit of using calipers, right? We're yeah. all like, everybody, you know, I use the joke, you know, every mechanic owns about 50 calipers, right? Um, this isn't where you have to use those calipers. You, you, a tape measure and a stick would probably do it for you. If you had a right angle, uh, uh, you know, you, you ultimately could measure it. And, and, and by doing that, you take those two numbers and you divide them together. And, you know, that that's usually tells you where you're at. Now, let's say you do get that measurement and you're at the, you know, you divide them together and it's like two and a half. Yeah. That's not going to be accurate in itself. So, yeah, I, we have had people have to remove the brake pedal, drill into that brake pedal, and have to change that pivot point. So, yeah, that was that's a fantastic question. It's like one of the last things you would think of. Yeah. You would, you, you know, you, you, you wouldn't think that, oh, I just spent all this money. I've changed everything at the wheel. I've changed everything at the wheel, and now I have to crawl underneath my car and, and, and drill a hole in the pedal? Question just came through here on the same topic. When switching over to uh, drum brakes to disc brakes, is there anything that needs to be done hydraulically after the master cylinder? So um, we typically recommend uh, a proportioning valve. Uh, so generally, like let's say you get, you get a kit. And you got to realize what type of kit that you get. Um, you know, Willwood, their kits are fantastic. I, I love their kits. They're, the quality is, is second to none. The only thing that you've got to make sure that you're watching is that Willwood sells kits that's everything at the wheel. you got to remember, the stopping isn't just done at the wheel. It's also done at the actual master cylinder, the brake booster if it has one, and the proportioning valve. So, yeah, you just put this $3,000 brake kit on there, but what else have you, you know, what else are we going to change here? So, we generally recommend, uh, you know, either an adjustable one, we sell those, or they sell them that, you know, if you're, you have uh, 67 Camaro with four-wheel disc brakes, you can get a proportioning valve that's proportioned properly for a four-disc brake setup. And that's like a fixed proportioning valve. That's those, those gold anodized uh, proportioning valves that you can get that are a fixed proportion. And then also, the question, I kind of see where this guy's going, you know, with drums, I mean, yeah, if you go with a clean install, I mean, you can get rid of a combination valve. Mm -hmm. um, the one I <clears throat> run into <clears throat> on a lot of vehicles is the... Um, the sudden leak valve. I'm trying to remember the name of it. <laughs> that basically, it detects you know if a sudden loss of fluid for yeah. one side or the other. Yeah. I, so it really, um, you know, and here's the other thing: is residual valves. Yes. That's another thing that um, it just depends on where that master cylinder is mounted. You know, if your master cylinder. You know, and you don't think, you know, in today's cars, you're used to popping a hood and right there's the master cylinder and your brakes are down here. Well, what if I were to tell you in 30s, 40s, 50s, even some 60s, the master cylinder was before or below the floor pan. So now is that master cylinder, you know, above the actual caliper, above that actual uh, wheel cylinder? If not, you're probably going to have to consider something with a residual valve. Yep. Because that's, a, a, well, also with brakes, because you're fighting that initial resistance on drum brakes with the springs. Oh, absolutely. That you don't have with a, um, a, a brake caliper. A uh, question here as far as with the kit, um, should I be worried about, along the same lines, the sizing of my master cylinder? Should I go bigger or smaller, or does it depend on the piston area of the caliper? Great question. Uh, so... It Number one, it depends on kit. If you buy a kit, um, uh, I'll use a company called Right Stuff Detailing. 
They're, they're located out of Cleveland here. Um, they make kits that uh, you generally can get the whole shoot and match. Yeah, you get everything at the wheel, but you also get, you know, or you can get, I should say, uh, the, the actual booster, master cylinder, proportioning valve. In that case, the answer would be no. In the case of you get a kit, maybe a Willwood kit, remember, we're only changing at the wheel with the majority of Willwood kits. You know, and I'm talking, and I guess, you know, you and I were, were talking about this earlier. Um, you need to kind of justify this. He, he brought up a really good point where he said, okay, late model cars, they sell these big brake kits or maybe these disc brake conversions. And yes, they are set up to be used with a stock master cylinder. Nope, no, no issues there. It's when we're talking, when you're changing from a drum brake application to a disc brake, and it's a late model, or excuse me, early model, you know, Chevelle, early model Mustang, early model Firebird, and it's only done at the wheel, yeah, you're probably more than likely going to have to change uh, master cylinder. Uh, and uh, somebody also asked pedal ratio. You're, you better look at that. And it's, in, and it's not like you, there's some mystical science or mystical measurement or anything with that. Yeah. It, it, it literally is just uncomfortable, especially if you're a big guy, to get underneath the car and, and, and or get underneath the dash and measure that real quick. And, and that way, if you know you're within that ratio, then you don't have to be taking a, a brake pedal out and, and drilling holes in it and everything. So, and You're right about knowing with what you have. There's a lot of older muscle cars out there where there were so many different brake packages in terms of, you know, let's take, for instance, American Motors. So you had the AMC 220, um, the 440, and each one of those, either it had disc brakes or it had drums. Mm -hmm. So. And then on top of that, the sizing of the drum for certain packages and certain power packages. And then on top of that, you also had just small changes that could really wreak havoc with some of the, if you're putting bigger brakes on it. Oh, yeah, without a doubt. I mean, you know, you know that we run into uh, like a common car um, we deal with is, is the uh, 67 to 69 Camaros. Um, you know, a 67 Camaro, believe it or not, back in the day, could have came with four-wheel disc. Yeah. That I mean, and and that's perfect for somebody that's doing some type of some type of racing. But if you had a different model, it could have come with four wheel drums. So yeah, to to kind of just add to what you're saying, you better know what you have. <laughs> <laughs> Question from an instructor here. This is great. Thank you, Mike. Can the friction coefficient of the friction material change? brake pedal feel. Oh, 100%. 100%. Yeah, I, I mean, uh, it just kind of goes along with what we were talking about with this Willwood setup. You know, uh, Willwood sells these kits where uh, they have different pads depending on what you do. You know, I, I mean, you're, it's, like, uh, it's like going to a uh, ice cream shop and get different flavors at the, at, the, at the stand. You can get one flavor where it's like, hey, this is more you, meant for street use, you know, uh, and it might have a lower, you know, coefficient where you have, you go to the other side of the stand and you're like, hey, you know, this is only a track car and, you know, I'm going to get a higher coefficient. Well, now when you do that, that can change where, you know, you go to stop real hard on initial stop and that pedal, you're kind of like, ooh, I don't like that. <laughs> I, you know, you're thinking I got this high dollar brake set up and... It's not stopping the way it should. Where, you know, we, we, we use that, uh, that term where we're like, uh, you have to warm up the brakes. You know, you change the coefficient of that, that brake, uh, brake pad, without a doubt, you're having to change, uh, you, you know, you're changing that pad, but you're also gonna have to warm it up. So that definitely would change the feel of it. And speaking as the stock guy, um, this really plays into replacement brake pads. If you're out there in the field, and you run into an application that the pedal changed because you changed the, the friction material. And if the friction material, the coefficient of friction isn't high enough, it can cause a brake pedal that may seem lower 
mm -hmm. or they might have to feel that they're applying more pressure to it. And that is a, a critical argument for using high quality brake pads because chances are if it's a real cheap line that's low quality um, and you pick it up online and what's happening is, is you have a brake pad manufacturer that may have only four or five different compounds for an entire line that's designed to cover 90% of the vehicles out there. So it may be good on a Ford Focus, mm -hmm. but then once you move that same material onto, let's say, a Silverado 1500, sure. that material may be at its limits. Um, so a reputable manufacturer of brake pads, um, you know, they may use up to 23, 24 yeah. different friction materials in the line just to suit the OE, thing, OE uh, feel of the brake pad, the coefficient of friction, and also the type of friction that may happen. I mean, you may have like a ceramic type style pad. I think this is what the stop tech is actually. Um, but those are designed to work with the OE rotors, the OE system, and once you start playing with that coefficient of friction, that's when you run into a lot of problems. Oh, without a doubt. You know, you, you talk about that, but then, you know, let's, let's talk about maybe why a customer would bring it back. You know, a uh, customer calls up or customer comes back to you and says, hey, man, I got this, uh, I got this, this brake system from you guys, or I got this, uh, my brakes done with you guys. And, you know, uh, yeah, it's quieter. Uh, yeah, it stops better, but the pedal doesn't feel the same. You know, that, that's to a point where you might have to come out as a tech or, you know, a service rider or something. And you might have to go over that with a customer and it, that might become a, a difficult conversation with somebody. Oh, by the way, sorry, we used a cheaper pad on you. Uh, it's all about the engineering, too. Yeah. <laughs> uh, the thing I see a, a lot of things happen, too, with that coefficient of friction is the type of friction. Um, you may have adherent friction, which is sort of like your NAOs and then also the ceramic things that actually throw down a layer of uh, transfer layer onto the rotor surface that works with the pad. So instead of, and the pad will transfer a certain amount of material onto the rotor um, that interacts with the pad. I've heard that close to 70% of stock vehicles selling this year will use a ceramic type pad. Oh, with I that type yeah. of friction. But on some of the more aggressive performance things, it's a semi-met pad that uses abrasive friction. So in other words, it's wearing out the pad, it's also wearing out the rotor itself um, to create that friction. So, for a performance application, yeah, I yeah. don't mind changing out my rotors. No, I, I, I wouldn't either. Um, this the only the other big side is is you're saying a performance application, uh, you know, then you start getting performance wheels. Why would you care about that? Well, you get this much more aggressive pad. Is it throwing more dust? And the last thing that you would want with a performance upgrade you know, is like, man, I got this great brakes. These are fantastic, but my wheels look like crap. You know, no, that, you know, if you know anything about cars, wheels could almost make or break a car. You know, you ever look at a car and you're like, ooh, that car's nice, but the wheels look stupid on it. You know, you, and, and then on top of it, you're like, oh, but it has wheel dust or brake dust all over it. So you, you kind of got to walk that fine line of, okay, what is the material made up of? Is it a low dust? If it's not a low dust, is this something that I'm going to have to clean my wheels all the time or it's going to make my wheels pitted? So it, it's, it's, it's kind of like one of those things that you really need to know, A, what you have, but B, um, what am I getting? Yeah. Question here that came in, it says, why, does, uh, why do ceramic brake pads not show brake dust as bad as a semi-met. Two reasons, actually, I found this out. Um, number one, color of the dust. Number two, it's also the uh, charge on that. If it's uh, a positive or negatively charged um, piece of material coming off of that brake pad, it sticks different. So if you have a semi-met pad, that's knocking off bits of rotor, bits of the pad itself, um, how that's electrically charged, it likes to stick to wheels. To wear ceramic, not so much. Mm -hmm. So another question here that just came in, more of an application question. Um, 
This one is for a, a drag racing car. Um, and he's wondering, should I do both front and rear brake kits? Oh, without a doubt. I mean, and, and the other thing is, is um, you got to ask yourself, uh, if it's a drag racing application, is it only a drag racing application? And and you and that that kind of that's a question that everybody's like, oh yeah, I take it to the track. But then do you do, do you drive it around town? Because if you drive it around town, it's more of a street strip application. It, it's not really a track application. And before I get into this, I, I just you need to justify that why. Because then you talk about Willwood, okay? They have these kits that the rotors are specifically only meant for drag racing. Why is that? Well, that's because the thickness of the rotor is, is considerably thinner and it's less weight. So if you drive it around town all the time, well, you, you're going to warp that rotor, wear out those pads, crack that rotor very quickly. This is also a reminder, also check the Tomorrow's Technician uh, YouTube channel, and we also did one on brake rotors and two-piece rotors and drilled and slotted. And we looked into uh, the different things to be aware of, but the thing that we discovered was just the differences in some of the Willwood rotors yeah. as far as, you know, you've got really skinny ones uh, for drag racing, really wide ones, and then, you know, it's like this one is just a, uh, a solid non-drilled or thing, but, you know, they have another one, I think it's the 72 vein one that has directional veins and yeah. better metallurgy. They're, they're, they're uh, I mean, their R&D uh, people are, 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 they're next level. I, I mean, it's, um, it, it's, so, it's so interesting to find that, you know, the, like the question that was asked, um, should I do both front and rear? You know, it, there's so many different flavors to this. And, you know, yes, you should do front and rear. Uh, one, because of uh, more clamping force, uh, stiffer pedal, um, less likely to have brake fade. Um, I don't know if any, if, if any of you guys have ever got to the end of the track and you pushed the brake and the brake didn't work. That's earth shattering. <laughs> You you start to you start to rethink a lot of uh, the, a lot of a lot of things in your life real quickly, right? Um, you know it, it's it, it, you know yes you have the sand that you run into and hopefully if you're smart enough you put a shoot on or parachute on it, um, but it, it it becomes an issue of what is your application, what is this being used for? So you know you can get that five thousand dollar Willwood brake kit, but is it really what you need? And that's the question that you have to ask yourself because maybe that $2,000 Willwood brake kit that is four-wheel disc is plenty for you and it will last you longer and will not throw as much brake dust. And, you know, it, there's just so many different, you know, positives. So the first thing before you do that is you have to ID what you have and what you're going for. Question just came in. This one's kind of interesting from Doug. What about Hydro Boost brakes? Is that something that should be done to a car that has a really tuned up camshaft? It, so here's the thing. Um, there's pluses and negatives to this. Number one, it's cost. Hydro Boost, man, it's, it's, not the, it's not the cheapest thing. Maybe for our students, maybe describe what Hydro Boost is. Um, uh, so instead of having a brake booster, um, you have an electronic boost. Uh, it's almost like, what would you say, like a module? Yeah. Um, on, the, on, the, on the firewall, and it helps decrease pedal effort. That's the whole purpose of a brake booster, is to decrease pedal effort, a.k.a. make it easier to push on the brake pedal. That's what it means. So when you go to a hydro boost system, you're thinking that I have this, you know, uh, big camshaft, big duration, big duration, low lobe separation engines. Um, like, uh, you know, you're going to throw Hydro Boost. I'm going to throw out some names of camshafts. Have you ever heard of a, a mother thumper, big mother thumper, 
Rattler cam, uh, bootlegger cam, you know, those are all different manufacturers of cams. What are they meant for? A very lopy idle? Negative. Uh, the big negative is they are very uh, low uh, engine vacuum. When you don't have a lot of engine vacuum, you can't feed that brake booster. You can usually flirt with the number 15 to 16 on a, on a brake booster, inches of vacuum or inches of mercury. But once you get into these mother thumper, these big mother thumpers, <laughs> um, engine vacuum is next to none. Now, you're like, well, pff, easy fix, Hydro Boost. Hydro Boost is not cheap. I mean, you're probably in the $1,000 to $2,000 range. Is there another option? Yes, there is another option. Um, it's only, the only bad thing about it is it's a little bit annoying. Uh, if you've ever walked past like a, I don't know, 98 to 2000 Chevy, yep. and you start it up and it has that buzzing noise, that mm, buzzing noise that you hear, that's the fuel pump. Well, why am I talking about this? Well, the next option is a vacuum pump or a vacuum and, and or a vacuum canister. So you can go to a vacuum pump. It will help supply enough vacuum for you to run a brake booster. Downside, it's about 250 to 350 on the price, and it's noisy. There, I, I've yet to find a quiet electric vacuum pump. You, people put them in boxes. People try to... Yep. They try every little trick in the book. I mean, you might as well just put earplugs in. I, I mean, and here's the other thing. You know, if you have a loud enough exhaust system, generally you don't hear it that much. Um, but that, that, that's another option. So to answer your question, do you have to? The answer is no. You got to know, A, how much engine vacuum are you building? You know, like my, my father-in-law, he has a 72 K10. All right, great big camshaft in it. Um, loves, you know, loves the big camshaft, loves the sound of the exhaust system, you know. But he only builds about 13 to 14. Um, and, you know, around town, that's rough. Yeah. You know, if you're driving on the freeway, it's generally not that bad. So he flirts with the uh, vacuum canister. Okay. So he hold he he routed. I mean, it's top of the line. He routed some uh, polished stainless steel lines to a vacuum canister and routed it to the the brake booster. Um, so that's an option. If you're on that borderline of that fifteen to sixteen, that's an option for you. If you don't want to spend that thousand to two thousand dollar range, you can go to a uh, vacuum pump, electric vacuum pump. And it runs the whole time. Yes, they have a switch on them, and yes, they do turn on and off. Um, but that's an option, much cheaper option, and it's a lot easier to install. But if you do go to a hydro, um, uh, you know, style braking system for the brake booster, that is an option, and then you don't have to worry about um, noise. Number one, and uh, number two. Uh, engine vacuum anymore. So, Eric Anderson brought up a good point here. He says, uh, with the uh, booster you or hydro boost, uh, if you lose your belt, that you still have. With a regular booster, you still have brakes. If you, yeah. With if you lose your belt on a hydro boost, you've lost your power steering. You've lost your brakes. Yeah, yeah, and that's uh, that's that's pretty earth shattering. Uh, I mean, I've had it. I have uh, hydro boost on uh, my factory one ton. Okay, and uh, I was, you know, I was trying to explain, <laughs> trying to explain to my wife. I was like, "Look, I said, if you start to notice any, you know, any any differences in this steering, uh, you know, you need to be careful because there's a possibility you don't have brakes." Yeah. And that's the, <laughs> that. That is a fantastic point because you could eat. You know, that's a that's a whole other ball game. So, you know, what's what are you doing here? You know, you got to you're going to give something up. To get what you want, and, and what are you willing to give up? I knew this question would come up when oh. we're doing this one. Um, what about big brake kits and ABS? Um, 
would it cause issues with the corrections of the stability control and ABS? You were talking about this earlier. Go ahead. Um, yeah, I've worked with brake and front end for over 20, 20 years, magazine all about replacement brake pads, and I've had a chance to talk to a few brake engineers on this in regards to big brake kits. And what happens with, number one, when you're changing up the caliper, and number two, when you're changing the diameter of the rotor. And the answer that I typically get is it probably will not cause issues with corrections for stability control or ABS if the friction level is above what it is or the ability to generate friction. And he said, you know what, if you really look at a, let's say a car is going around a corner and it starts to over and then understeer and the stability control is making corrections, it's doing that with the brakes. It's not doing it with the steering, it's not doing it with the engine power. It's all brake, and if you look at how those corrections are done, it's done on each side of the vehicle, and it's basically, it's like a tank. Sure. You're pulling two levers, creating friction on different sides to get the car to go back on track and regain stability. He said, you know what, if it's generating expected friction level, um, even if it's a little bit higher, it should not cause any issues with ABS or stability control. Um, in fact, he, this one engineer said it might just improve it and shorten those correction times. Because if you get a car that has, number one, poor tires on it, yeah. number two, <laughs> the wrong brake pads that are worn out, um, it will cause issues with the correction of ABS and even traction control. Um, but if everything's functioning properly and the friction levels are within inside a certain goal and then also with the fluid, it's sort of a correction process with ABS and the modulator because basically it's looking at the wheel speeds versus what the brake system is doing versus the correction and then you have yaw, lateral acceleration, does the driver still have their foot and it's part of a general equation but the general feedback is if it's making the corrections and the wheels rolling the way it should be according to the wheel speed sensors then there shouldn't be an issue. Yeah I would tend to agree with you. Um, be, in, the, in, in a lot of the, the basis that I'm going off of is, 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 is we sell so many of these kits, right? And so many of these kits, you know, yeah, they're for the late model cars, you know. And I have yet to really see somebody come back and call back about, man, I got this, this, this big brake system and now I'm having all these ABS codes and all these ABS lights because of that. Yeah, I, I never see it, and, you know, this is the thing to remember if you do have your ABS type training is remember it's a correction where it's looking at to lock or unlock a wheel according to the wheel speed sensor. It really isn't looking at the friction level of the brake pad, the size of the rotor and everything else. It's right. a correction. It's sort of like an oxygen sensor more or yeah. less. Yeah, it, it, if it's improving it, just because it's larger or just because the the um, you know, the coefficient of the uh, of the brake pad is is it increased or decreased or whatever. Um, as long as it's improving it, you really shouldn't have that issue of ABS lights. Coming in our last five minutes of the live cast, so please keep those questions coming in. Um, just in regards to you know you mentioned before uh, truck brakes, Jeep is pretty popular. Yeah. What type of upgrades are those for an off-road? So it really depends on what axle they go with, you know. So if it's the, a Dana or... A, oh or my, yeah. I mean, it, so, you know, when you talk about Jeeps, Jeeps uh, are, are, oh my gosh, there's so many upgrades for Jeeps, it, it's ridiculous. But then you got to figure out, okay, well, I do this, this brake upgrade, is this the axle that I'm going to stick with? You know, because a lot of people, you know, the, the age-old way is to get a couple Dana 60 full widths off of a, a one-ton truck, throw it underneath there, and it's bulletproof. Yeah. Well, probably the, the around the, you know, depending on what you're doing and, again, how much horsepower and everything. But a, a set of eight-lug rotors are, are plenty enough for uh, a, a factory Jeep. Um, question here, what about brake fluid? Oh, yeah. 
Yeah, we notice, um, again, what are you doing? So the, the, they have different, t uh, different temperature ratings on these brake fluid, uh, and, and it's uh, the resistance of boiling. And, uh, you know, you sit back and think, man, my, my brake fluid could boil? You know, at, at the track, that's not unheard of. That is not unheard of, especially, again, the autocross, the road race, um, people like that. They would humongously, uh, you know, benefit from the fact that, you know, they, they upgrade to a different uh, brake fluid. Willwood, again, another great company to go with. They have different uh, temperature ratings on their actual, uh, you know, brake fluid. So, you know, it, I don't know if, again, the factory application, I don't know if that's a huge thing, uh, but definitely, definitely with race cars. And also, if you're a technician out there, um, pay attention to the cap of the brake system because you're going to start to see newer applications made after 2018 to maybe 2019, and you'll start to see this dot four LV, low viscosity, that's yeah. designed to work with the stability control system and the ABS HCU and the valves that it can open really quickly. And, and it's designed to reduce foaming and also some of the corrections that um, these systems can pull off. And you'll also see, if you're in the European world, dot four plus on some of the caps, but you'll see more in the specifications a dot four LV. Um, you're also going to see uh, dot 5.1, which is supposedly, you know, a higher temperature, also designed to work with uh, ABS systems, or uh, also dot 5.1, I think it's ESP. Mm -hmm. I think that's more of the ATE type designation, but yes, pay attention to your brake fluid because if you install lower quality brake fluid that has a low <laughs> potential, you're never going to get everything out of this caliper. No, not at all. So Mark, anything you'd like to add? Uh, just uh, the, like I said, it, you know, we've, we've started this whole conversation um, on, on disc brakes. Um, you know, and the conversions. I, I guess the, the biggest thing that I want to say is, A, you need to define what you're doing and what your application is. Um, because there's so many different uh, applications out there. And, uh, and what you're doing, it, it'll affect what you buy. And then, what do you have? And, and, and make sure you really know what you have. Especially if you bought it off a of buddy. <laughs> I, I mean, you know, that, that ends up, you know, well, I bought this car off my neighbor, blah, 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 and he did this, and I think he did that. And that could turn, you know, it's, it's the age old uh, meme that you see on Facebook or whatever um, that, you know, it turns a, a two hour job into a uh, uh, two week job, you know, because you're chasing the ghost from the past. So, so know what you have know what you're aiming for, um, and, and, and definitely um, quality is a huge thing with this. Because you start going cheaper in these brands, you will notice a difference um, in the quality of it. Thank you, Mark. Um, this is a notice to instructors out there is coming up, and I'll get the exact date through the email list, um, for our next live cast with Summit. And this one's going to be in regards to custom wheels and mounting and balancing. So we're probably going to come in here, show you how to measure a rim and, you know, what is the different, as you said, for offset, bolt pattern. Oh, man. You know, you, you would think, uh, you know, you could be pretty dangerous uh, with a tape measure, uh, measuring a wheel. And the word is dangerous because uh, if you don't measure it correctly, um, then it turns into a, <laughs> a bad time. But that's going to be our next one coming up. It's going to be a lot of fun. So we'll uh, keep you notified on the future date here. But thank you, instructors, for attending. And also students, too. Have a good rest of your day.